Thank you, uh, Richard. Uh, hello, all. I'm happy to moderate uh, this roundtable on discoverability of uh, cultural content, uh, how open data can contribute to discoverability of this uh, content. Uh, our uh, guests will talk about uh, uh, projects in data uh, sharing and how open data can help discover cultural content. And then uh, there will be uh, questions and discussion with the member of the uh, of the participants. And for those who don't know who discoverability is, we will define what it is. But discoverability designates the result of documentation and com communication about a content in various um, digital platforms, uh, um, like a library or a music content. A concrete example of discoverability with open data on a uh, search engine, I look for cultural sites in Quebec, and in the results, I can find uh, uh, sets of uh, open data on uh, museums, uh, libraries, and other cultural institutions. That's the uh, uh, the presentation of this data that enables the uh, search engine to find the sources of information in answer to my request. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce my first uh, guest. I only see myself, I don't see him, there he is. So Alexandre No, he is a research agent and uh, uh, officer for um, planif uh, planning at the uh, Culture and Communications uh, Department Ministry in Quebec. So he will talk about the ministry's uh, vision for the use of data for culture, arts, and uh, um, heritage. So Alexandre, you're up. Thank you, José. Thank you all. I'm very happy to be with you today. I think that the PowerPoint presentation is not yet online, but we will start slowly. And we will start by uh, talking about initiatives uh, in open, open data that uh, we, have, uh, um, we have done. So the, implication, the um, participation of our ministry started in 2012 when Quebec government uh, uh, one decided to become an open government, and our involvement started with the publishing of 16 sets of heritage data and a 17th that followed a few years later. So what we have to remember is that uh, despite uh, I'm just uh, go back to the right slide in my power plant. <laughs> so despite the strong beginnings of our environment, it's only in 2014 that the ministry uh, was able to, uh, to uh, launch uh, the uh, digital plan. And it's this plan that will crystallize uh, the digital vision uh, within the ministry. This uh, digital cultural plan uh, it will help uh, uh, the cultural sector to use uh, digital uh, formats in order to uh, make Quebec's cultural content better known. In 2016, we're not uh, looking at data right now. We'll have to wait in 2017 to uh, finally to see how um, the open data becomes important in the ministry with uh, after a, a report on a cultural content. The report was published by the Observatoire de la Culture et des Communications du Québec. And in this uh, report, for the first time, 
uh, we mentioned that there is not enough uh, cohesion in the use of data. There's not enough uh, uh, um, transparency. After that report, uh, the ministry uh, took two measures, uh, 111 and 113. 111 was an action plan of, about uh, cultural content in Quebec. And this measure enabled us uh, to create five sexual committees. Uh, so uh, by that, I mean people uh, from the, uh, the sector who wanted to, to discuss and collaborate on the um, digital uh, transformation. So we had one for books, uh, cinema, audiovisual, uh, audiovisual music, and uh, performance arts. Another objective was uh, to uh, create um, uh, common standards. And the objective there was to create a standard that would help to create an interoperability of data in the sector, which was a problem. Um, we wanted the sector to collaborate uh, more easily and uh, to uh, exchange more easily. And then measure 113 uh, was an ontology of Quebec uh, cultural heritage. And with this measure, we uh, we were able to see uh, the interest for open data. And, and it's following comments on measure 113 that we started to work on different ontological models and other uh, projects. Um, a, a web semantic project. And that brings me to the project I wanted to talk to you. They see we have a little bit of a, a problem with the visuals. If we can fix that, I will show you later. So the project for uh, the publishing sector is a project from Polytechnique Montréal, so university project that was using data from the publishing sector and to put it into a uh, well-established ontologic uh, uh, model. And the objective was to gather these data, to structure it, and then to open it, uh, to use the open data online uh, through a uh, Wikidata database. So we wanted to get the information in Wikidata to complete uh, our data and to see what uh, use uh, could be made of this data. And at the same time, we had another project uh, from Production Horizon. Uh, in uh, Quebec's uh, uh, plan for revitalizing the sector. And uh, we want to reuse the data used by Polytechnique Montréal and put the data in Wikidata and to um, add pages into Wikipedia and use uh, data from other partners. Despite what I have said, our reflection on open data continue to, to uh, evolve. But in 2019, we take a turn on discoverability, which is based on information on the possibility of uh, discovering cultural content. I mentioned 2019 because that's the year when the Franco-Quebec uh, mission on cultural content was launched with uh, the government of France. And that mission has, uh, for example, to launch uh, in initiatives and projects with 12 levers of decoverability. You, you can check them online since uh, you can't see them now on the screen. So these 12 levers use uh, different steps to bring the Quebec cultural content and a French uh, to be uh, broadcast and to be more present online. And after the launching of that mission, our orientation uh, changed to uh, be a more uh, 
uh, centered on the coverability more so than in the past. In the past, we were looking on the on publishing online this content by uh, using open data. By publishing open data, we weren't uh, uh, concentrating very much on their uh, on the use of this data. So, in parallel with these initiatives, uh, we published two guides, uh, two manuals that you can uh, 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 check out. We will put the links in the chat later. One guide uh, is uh, uh, is on uh, open data to help organizations uh, in their uh, dis discoverability, and uh, we did that with the Treasury Board Secretariat. Uh, and our department and this uh, helped a collaborator a cooperator to take all the guide uh, and translate it in english so it's available in both languages so it's even more accessible than what we had first uh, thought there is also a guide uh, on uh, best practices in order to uh, present the basis of decoverability as we see it in the ministry and as was mentioned in introduction. So all of this brings me to our last project that I want to talk about, which is related to a, a discoverability objectives that uh, we set out in 2019. So our objective is not uh, simply to put uh, data online, but we want to encourage uh, uh, people to use uh, the data and it was done within a, a plan to uh, to encourage open government a plan from treasury board of course and uh, we want to create an an open data ecosystem which is accessible and we worked uh, with media film and the objective was uh, to develop a network of open data in the film uh, sector so that media film could use uh, uh, these uh, tools to develop new tools and so this app allows users to look for a movie and find out where the film is available and where it can be seen. So that's a very useful app. And uh, over the next months, it was continued to evolve uh, with the help of the Open Media Network and uh, important partners like uh, Cinémathèque Québécoise and the uh, a library and archives, uh, and we uh, we noticed that open data that's fine, but we should go further. And the cooperation around this project uh, showed the potential of these uh, data. We're even creating partnerships uh, with the greater sectors, like the, the publishing sector, uh, to uh, to build on the Dunnies and a well-prepared open data can have uh, important impact in the cultural sector and uh, can uh, stimulate uh, important and innovative uh, uh, initiatives. I'm sorry, I was a little, uh, I went through this uh, very quickly, but I wanted to leave time for uh, questions and debates. So uh, back to you, Lucy. Uh, thank you very much, Alexandre. And so now we move on to Lucie Signard, who works at uh, Quebec's National Library and Archives. And I think Lucie will be able to talk about uh, means used by library and archives uh, to contribute to discoverability of uh, cultural contents. So, uh, so I will let you uh, tell us about your projects. So uh, over to you, Lucy. Well, thank you, Lucy. We have a little uh, uh, technical problem. Um, I don't know if we'll be able to see the uh, the um, the presentation. That's an objective. Uh, discoverability is an objective. And before uh, talking about various projects, I would like uh, to, if we could get uh, the presentation up on the screen. Uh, 
So we are three uh, institutions, a great library, National Archives, the National Bi Library. Even if uh, they have their own uh, functions, they have the same ambition, which is to democratize uh, um, culture and knowledge. Uh, can we go back to the start, please? I'm sorry, That's. it seems that that's all we can do. We can't move forward or back. I'm really sorry. Okay, so it's going to be complicated because I wanted to give some visual examples. So as I was saying, so uh, we're made up of three uh, institutions, our National Archives, National Library, and uh, the uh, Grande Bibliothèque. We're almost there. Can we go back a little bit more? Okay, that's good. There's three institutions that I mentioned that are that all have the same ambition, which is to democratize culture and knowledge by being always more inspiring, more connected, and more accessible. And that's a key word here for this presentation. So if you say accessibility, that means working on discoverability of our content, content so that it is more visible for users. I think that the application is a, a bit delayed here. Okay, here we are. I'm sorry, it's completely out of my control. Maybe the second slide, if you have it. Uh, the second BANQ one. The next one? Sorry, I should have said the third one. Okay. So, the discoverability of our content. So, how do we achieve this? So, we have the example of three projects by BANQ. They're all very different. But we worked on structuring our data and opening our data to improve accessibility. So, the first project I wanted to talk to you about is from last year, and it's ongoing today. It is a BANQ numérique or BANQ digital. And the idea here is uh, most to do with referencing, so the natural referencing of files so that the users can find those files more easily. Let's move on to the next slide. Here we go. So it's a platform, and you'll find Quebec documentaries on there in digital format, photographs, among other things. There are 24 million files on that platform. We worked very hard to structure our metadata to make the files more easily findable for users. On the left, you have the view that a user would see on the platform. And to the right, it's the same photo. And you can see how we saw the screen when we were working on it to add in the reference information, the date, the creator, etc. All of this in order to help users find it more easily. And the result is staggering when you look at uh, usability. So in 2020, between 2020 when work began and 2021, the visits increased by 50%. So visibility was improved. There were 2 million visits. Uh, per month. At one point, that has increased to 3 million views per month. So you can really tell the impact that our work had on the usability. 
This is another project now, very different from the first. It's a more focused on data base creation. And here we go, I'll show you. Here's the ISBN, that's the number to uh, identify files is the same number used uh, world round. And in Quebec, it is the uh, Quebec National Library that assigns ISBNs. So there's a list of all of the documents published in Quebec that have an ISBN. And our goal with this project was to create a data set that was uh, shareable and open and accessible for everyone. And you can see here all of the metadata that characterize the ISBN. So you have the editor, the title, the creation date, etc. So 175,000 documents have been published in Quebec over the past years. And we want for them all to be in a very structured format and easy to find. So we use the XML format. And we had to work very hard to translate certain files to make them presentable and easily findable. We also had another challenge. We had to make sure that the documents were interoperable. So we followed a model that let us use RDF format. And what that means is on a scale of one to five from a data being closed to open, you can see that we achieved level five. So our data is very open, very operable. We still haven't achieved a five, but we're not far off. The collaborative platform is uh, Donné Québec, or Québec Data. And here is the third project that I would like to share with you. And it will give you an, I'll give you an idea of the work that we did on this. So it's the ISNI, which is a sort of similar to an ISBN, and it characterizes a group or a person. So it could be um, a musician or an artist, etc. So the ISNI is like the ISBN used worldwide. And it is the Quebec National Library that attributes the ISNI numbers. And in this data set, the logic is similar to the ISBN system. So in our case, You'll get the person's name, their profession, um, dates, associated dates, and so forth. And certain key organizations can uh, share that data, for example, in the sector of arts or music. An example of a collaborator we worked with for Open Data that we worked with uh, Meta Music. And what they want is to increase the discoverability, especially for uh, musicians. So they want to work on ISNIs for musicians and work on platforms to uh, promote Quebec music. So this is a data set in this project, a data set that is shared with organizations. So those were the three projects that I wanted to share with you today. As you saw, there are three very different projects, but we're always uh, working on the structure of our data and trying to make those data as open as possible whether it be with uh, Quebec work or Quebec books, music, or other heritage works. Thank you very much, Lucie.
And uh, we saw something come back again in this uh, summit. We always talk about how important the openness of data is, but we see if there are problems with the format, the semantic problems, uh, that means not everyone using the same words or the same structure, that does lead to problems. So those projects are very typical and similar to other projects in the culture sector. And we see that Lucy was working on structure and standardization. Now we'll move on to Nathalie Thibault. She is a protector of archives and in charge of uh, digital broadcasting in the Quebec National Gallery. Hello, Nathalie. Can you talk to us about open data in your area? Sound quality does not allow for interpretation at this time. Service will resume as soon as possible. Quand on a réfléchi à mettre en place un nouveau site des collections, 
on s'est penché sur quest ce qui se faisait dans les grands musées à l'international et on a réalisé qu'il y avait déjà des musées qui étaient consommateurs de données ouvertes, que ce soit le Metropolitan Museum ou encore le Tate Gallery à Londres. Alors, on s'est dit qu'on pourrait déjà bénéficier d'un chantier comme Wikidata pour aller chercher des données qui existaient déjà sur des artistes québécois et canadiens et qui manquaient un peu, un peu quand même de, de substance. Alors, on s'est dit on va être consommateur de données sur notre site des collections et par la suite, on va être producteur de, de données pour justement redonner au suivant. Alors, dans le cas du Musée national des beaux-arts du Québec, c'est la consommation qui a été le, le premier élément déclencheur. Et en deuxième, on est arrivé avec euh, des versements d'informations euh, sur Wikidata et sur Wikipédia au niveau des articles. Tout ça a fait que ça nous a permis de faire une normalisation de plusieurs champs, de créer des nouveaux champs qui amènent la, des réflexions sur la diversité en termes d'identité, en termes de culture, en termes d'artistes représentés en nous n'avait qu'au nous n'avons, de, de, de vraiment voir comment le territoire était présenté dans les différents outils thésaurus et euh, dictionnaires de données. Ça, ça a été un gros travail euh, qu'on a fait en même temps qu'on déployait le site des collections. Vous pouvez avancer, s'il vous plaît. Merci beaucoup. Alors, je vous donne un exemple de consommation de données ouvertes par le musée. Sur notre site des collections, je vous enverrai tantôt des liens. Euh, on peut vraiment aller chercher euh, l'information qui est directement dans Wikidata et euh, en français et aussi euh, permettre de faire des liens vers justement des contenus euh, qui sont importants soit chez BNQ, soit chez d'autres partenaires comme le ministère de la Culture avec son répertoire du patrimoine culturel du Québec. Alors, on a vraiment voulu déjà exploiter les contenus culturels qui étaient déjà présents sur le web et les intégrer dans Wikidata pour que d'autres personnes aussi puissent, pour une artiste comme Rita Mante, exemple, aller voir tout ce qui existait déjà en termes de contenu québécois placé sur le web. Et par la suite, on est venu complémenter euh, l'information avec euh, une diffusion et euh, nommer les différents musées au Québec et au Canada qui possèdent des œuvres de cet artiste. Et aller, on est allé euh, ajouter beaucoup de données sur chacun des artistes parce que, en sachant que le musée est aussi une bibliothèque et un centre, qui, qui possède une bibliothèque et un centre de documentation, on était à même d'avoir les sources publiées fiables pour pouvoir faire ce travail. Et tant qu'à réviser l'ensemble des données biographiques, sur l'artiste, on en a profité pour faire vraiment une normalisation, puis même s'entendre sur les fichiers d'autorité de bibliothèque pour avoir les mêmes dates ou les mêmes recherches en termes de généalogie ou de, de normalisation de données. C'est un immense travail de nettoyage qu'on ne voit pas. Nous, on voit la partie qui est vraiment apparente, et je peux vous dire que c'est tout un iceberg qui est caché derrière ce travail de, de jeu de données ouvertes sur Wikidata et pour aussi exploiter des jeux de données sur euh, données-québec.ca, si vous voulez avancer. Euh, pour euh, le chantier des artistes, euh, on avait commencé à petite échelle, on avait fait vraiment un projet pilote avec 300 artistes québécois, et là on s'est rendu compte qu'il y avait des lacunes, on avait peu de données sur les photographes québécois, les céramistes, les designers, les orfèvres, les artistes inuits qui représentent près de 800 artistes dans la collection du musée. Alors, on s'est vraiment donné pour que ces données-là soient euh, accessibles euh, à d'autres institutions ou à d'autres partenaires qui aimeraient euh, en profiter. Euh, on a aussi été, euh, on a pris la peine de, de, de mentionner les fonds d'archives de BNQ qui, euh, qui étaient en lien avec nos artistes, avec nos collections, nos œuvres. On a vraiment fait un travail déjà de, de comprendre qu'est-ce qui étaient les données existantes en 2020. En ne sachant pas euh, un jour qu'est-ce qui pourrait être exploité par rapport à ces données-là qu'on a versées, parce qu'il faut savoir qu'on ne verse jamais des données euh, confidentielles, on n'a jamais versé une date euh, complète de naissance, c'est soit l'année qui est déjà publiée dans un livre. Alors, on est très, très, très à l'affût par rapport à, à, au renseignement personnel comme ministère et organisme, de ne de, de pas euh, aller plus loin que qu'est-ce que notre mandat euh, institutionnel peut nous permettre. Ça, ça a été aussi un chantier important qui continue. Quand je vous parle de chantier, c'est des chantiers qui sont toujours en cours, tant au niveau du Wikidata, de l'actualisation de nos données et euh, des différents humains aussi. Euh, <rire> je suis en train de lire le « on reste des humains », excusez. Je suis en train de lire un commentaire. Euh, c'est ça, de, de vraiment euh, se placer euh, derrière les silos de nos bases de données qui, entre autres, ne se parlaient pas, mais aussi par rapport à d'autres organisations euh, au sein du patrimoine culturel et artistique du Québec qui non plus euh, n'avaient pas d'assises pour pouvoir échanger l'information. 
Fait qu'on s'est servi aussi des Disney qui ont été euh, versés par BNQ. Fait qu'on arrive avec vraiment une belle, euh, comment dire, une belle base pour euh, que les gens qui veulent utiliser ou réutiliser des, des données ouvertes puissent euh, partir avec une bonne base pour les artistes canadiens et québécois. Et euh, quand je pense à, à l'ISNI, ben, je pense à beaucoup de différenciation. Je vous donne l'exemple de, du peintre euh, de, la, de la peintre Marie Laberge. Il existe une peintre Marie, Marie Laberge, mais aussi une écrivaine. Alors, ça permet de distinguer beaucoup de monimes qu'on avait là, euh, qui portaient euh, confusion là, dans certaines euh, bases de données. On peut avancer. Euh, et c'est ça, ça c'est des, des bénéfices qu'on a eus euh, par rapport à notre jeu de données ouverte qui a été moins consulté sur le site de Données Québec. On est allé vérifier les statistiques, mais qu'on a eu quand même beaucoup d'écho à travers les, les gens qui étaient des non-utilisateurs d'images, mais plutôt de données. Il y en a qui en ont, qui en ont exploré euh, des effets avec des applications pour l'art public, placer l'art public à travers une géographie. Euh, ça nous a permis aussi, avec la, la révision des données, de faire des nouvelles attributions sur des artistes qu'on ne connaissait pas, qui étaient un peu plus internationales, mais que nous, on n'avait pas vraiment fait de recherche. Euh, ça nous permet d'arriver vers une interopérabilité qui est en progression, je vous dirais, par rapport aux normes et aux thésaurus euh, qui sont euh, à venir. C'est aussi que ça nous permet aussi une recherche constante sur les collections de musées qui comportent près de 42 000 œuvres et objets. Et le grand atout pour nous qu'on a bénéficié, c'est qu'on a une veille informationnelle maintenant qui est semi-automatisée sur ces artistes et qui nous permet vraiment encore plus de mettre à jour l'information qu'on qu dispose sur les artistes et sur les œuvres, les œuvres d'art aussi. Je pense qu'il ne me reste pas beaucoup de temps. Alors, euh, je vous donne l'exemple du prochain jeu de données qu'on va ajouter sur euh, le site de Données Québec. Et on va ajouter l'identifiant qui data tant qu'à l'avoir euh, inclus dans nos recherches. Puis aussi, l'image, l'image est super importante dans les, euh, les recherches que les gens font pour euh, les données. Mais on a maintenant un permalien vers l'image. Si l'image est libre de droit, là, bien entendu, alors euh, quelqu'un qui, euh, qui crée un jeu de données va pouvoir faire afficher l'image avec... Euh, un URL qui est permanent là, pour euh, les images du musée, ce qui n'était pas le cas dans les premiers jeux de données qu'on avait fait au musée. Euh, si on peut continuer, merci. Alors ça, je vous donne juste un petit exemple de graphe bien simple, mais pour nous, on le trouvait intéressant parce que c'est plus de 1000 musées à travers le monde qui détiennent des œuvres ou des objets des mêmes artistes dans la collection du musée. Alors le musée, c'est 4000 artistes qui sont représentés dans Wikidata pour, à ce jour. Et on voit qu'on est capable d'aller voir le Musée des beaux-arts du Canada qui détient à peu près 750 euh, artistes similaires à nous. Alors, on a créé des liens avec beaucoup d'institutions grâce aux, jeux, euh, aux données ouvertes et aux jeux de données qu'on a fait parce qu'on a eu des interrogations de leur part. Puis, on a pu collaborer à faire modifier des informations qui étaient soit moins documentées ou erronées. Fait qu'on a vraiment une belle représentation à travers euh, le Canada et le Québec. Et les, les musées du Québec, en ce moment, s'intéressent à ces projets-là. Alors, on échange beaucoup avec eux là, depuis quelques mois, je vous dirais, là, sur euh, nos projets qu'on a réalisés à petite échelle, en pensant pas que ça aurait une ampleur aussi importante. Alors, ça vous donne une petite idée, un aperçu très court de tout ce qui a été fait à travers euh, deux années importantes pour le musée, pour le rayonnement, l'accès, puis aussi euh, le, le potentiel de réutilisation. Alors voilà, je pense que j'ai peut-être une dernière à cette date. Peut-être pas. <rire> je sais pas. À cette date, ce mot euh, me rappelle. <rire> je ne voulais pas dire un anglicisme. <rire> je ne sais pas si c'est un anglicisme. À peau, à cette date, ça revient toujours aux mêmes même vieilles technologies. Merci yes. beaucoup. Acetate or slide, these words are the same and they bring back memories for us. And thank you for your presentation. Your presentation gave us some interesting results and it gave us some real life applications for that kind of data. All three presentations were useful because they show that it's a construction site. These are construction sites for the structure and the organization of the knowledge in order to better share them. So that's how we see the central role of open data it gives us a possibility to structure data and to make it as available, as widely available as possible. We can also see how as data producers, we can use them and how we can use data more openly. 
Now, before we go to questions, I just have one quick question for the group. If you had an element that that would facilitate the use or the production of open data projects, what would that element be for you? And what would you want to put an emphasis on? So I am going to start at the beginning with Alexandre. Yeah, we can definitely proceed that way. If there was a single element that I would choose, I would say that it's collaboration. In our last project, we saw that collaboration between all the stakeholders is very important. It helped us to create a relationship with different groups of people. It also helped us to foster relationships and strengthen them. So I think that for us, it's very important to have partners and collaborate with them. And we need to better structure things. So that helps us to increase the discoverability. Well, that's that's beautiful. So there's collaboration, and that also means having a new way of working or creating new ways of working, changing our ways. And what about Lucie from the BNQ? What is the element that would that would help move forward these open data projects. I agree with Alexandre, we should be able to collaborate and put our data together because sometimes that same data is reused by different groups. So for us, there is an incentive to harmonize the data and make it easier to access and work with for everyone. Thank you. Nathalie. Well, it's mostly that there was a data, a study that was done, but we are curious. We want to work on biography with Wikidata. So for us, it came from users. Users knew the biography and users the interpreter is unable to work with the current sound quality. Interpretation will resume once the sound improves. That's really interesting. So you're talking about potential users and you're talking about our, the, the different, the different uh, audiences that we can have. And you're also talking about what kind of data could be useful to them or the kind of questions that the data can answer. So today, uh, okay, so we're getting some answers, some questions actually from the audience. And this, the questions are about your specialties. Right now we're talking about museums and we're talking about art. And sometimes the jargon can be uh, unknown to people who work in different sectors. So when we were asking about the doubling core, for example, it's a structure and a uh, terminology about how to organize information. So there's a question for BNQ. Have you considered putting all of your information in Wikidata. Yes, we are looking at what we can do because yes, we want to go from the XML format and translate stuff to an, a more accessible format, but there is another way that we could do things to have a more interoperable data set. So this is the next step that we are considering right now. Thank you. Okay, there's another question. This question is a bit far from open data. It's more technical, but here we go. So knowing that Wikidata is thinking of bridging the information 
towards other identifiable data like the Q identifier. Do you find that your method is still the best for disambiguation of the number of creators that exist and avoiding same name creators? So that's a good question. Is anyone willing to give a quick answer here? Well, it's also a pedagogical question because it's a high level question. I can answer. Well, I think I would use the ISNI because it's an identifier that is well known and it doesn't identify people in particular. So yes, I think that we would have the ISNI, which is well-renowned for things like this. Perfect. And that doesn't prevent us from using other types of data. Okay, but I understand that we're going to try to use a normalized identifier for people who don't know. So when we talk about normalization, it means that there's a structure, there's an organization in order to manage things properly and update them so that we can follow the latest standards. So for ISO, for example, this is for the International Standards Organization. So they harmonize things to make sure that identifiers are applied and managed according to the determined rules. Natalie, do you wanna do you want to add something? Alexandre? Oh, I'm going to let Natalie go. Interpretation will resume once the sound improves. Alexandre? Oui. Ben, en fait... Alexandre? Yes. So for us, given that we are touching upon multiple sectors, we are trying to make sure that these sectors represent people. Yes, we see that sometimes unique identifiers get multiplied because we know that the BNQ is a representative of the ISNI and it facilitates things, but not everyone has that possibility. Not everyone has access to that database and it's not possible for all institutions to disambiguate. So for us, even though the ISNI is more and more present, sometimes we try to add extra identifiers to facilitate exchanges between institutions. And Natalie, I think your example is really good. Yes, you mentioned Wikidata and Wikidata helps us to create a bridge towards other institutions that do not yet have ISNI or that don't yet use it. Yes, absolutely. And uh, we find that there it, there's a lot of data and that data can help us interconnect data sets and other data sets that are not using the same identifiers. Wikidata is not a normalization group. So if we want something that's normalized, we try to go and work with normalization organizations, but we can sometimes use Q identifiers. These are element identifiers within a data set. But there, there may be other solutions. Are there other questions that we're waiting for an answer? Well, I have a question. I often hear about new projects with open data, but in your opinion, what do we need? Do we need to have other types of skills? Is there a way to take advantage of 
open data in new and better ways? Who wants to answer first? Okay, well, not everyone at the same time. Okay, well, we could go in the same order as last time. I think that what changed and what evolved is that we have more competent people. Once upon a time, data was not at the forefront. Data was this dark, somber thing that we were keeping hidden. But at the time, we didn't have people who were very sophisticated with data. But now things are changing. Now we have multiple partners and people are also getting trained on descriptive data. People are getting taught how to better consume the data too. So all of these skills need to be developed and we need to highlight them so that people understand the importance that something as small as data can have. And people need to see how that can improve discoverability and help Quebec's culture shine. Lucie? In terms of skills, I think that it's a two-pronged thing. So there's the analysis because we need people who analyze things better. And there's also the digital marketing aspect. So yes, we want to improve data. We want to we want to use data at its full value. So this is one of the few things that we would need to improve in the next few years. Okay, well, it looks like we already have a lot of demand for analytics at this time. Well, thank you. And Natalie, go ahead. The interpretation will resume once the sound quality improves. Um, je parle au moins à deux organisations qui, qui sont qui ont déjà qui, dans, dans, pour lesquelles well, c'est I've been talking to two organizations where this is part of their DNA. They try to use the data, they try to manage the data, but unfortunately, most cultural stakeholders do not have that same approach. So what could we come up with in order to help people become data specialists? And what can we teach them about indexation and cataloging? What can we do to find a way to contribute more? What can we do to better share data and information about the data that we have? And what can we conceive as a way to help all stakeholders so that they can all participate and contribute? Are we heading towards, towards a tendency where we put our information together? Maybe that concept is not very well understood at the moment, but would it be useful to to do that? Should Canada use its public strength? Should it use the state? And should it use, should it use entities like departments? So should we use them to find a way to merge and to increase access for skills and infrastructure. Well, that's the objective for the digital agents. We try to widen that, that group of experts, and we also try to give help to people who are trying to exploit the data. Yes, there is a lot more to do. I think that the network is growing really well, but we could still do some more. And I think that we can give extra help for the technical aspect of things because not everyone understands that aspect and not all organizations can afford to pay specialists. So we need to leverage these experts and we 
I think that it's going to become inevitable. I think that the environment will keep developing and and I think that training will be important to help these organizations to grow and evolve. Well, it would probably be best to help these structures grow and continue. And yes, we would like to have more specialists. Yes, we would like to see more skills developed, but there are all kinds of professions that use data and all kinds of professions where people produce data. There are many aspects that are also under consideration like ethics, privacy, inclusion. So all of these things cannot necessarily be managed by the same person. So it means that there are possibilities for solutions. We are reaching the end of this session. So not all countries want to work with open data, but I think that in general, the projects that we've heard about open data and we've heard about we've heard about your willingness to transform things. So I mean, I myself have seen it with my own eyes and I've I have just heard it with my own ears. So I know that you guys want to change things, you want to change the structure, you want to improve things, you want to have a multidisciplinary approach. So this is a, this is a big change that open data can have. Open data can be a real change for the sector. And I think that today we had a beautiful example of that. So I thank you all for your participation today. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and your experience. And once again, I am going to wish you good luck for your projects. And I hope that you'll be back to tell us more about them.